Guys, uh, to save the time, we will not wait three more minutes. I think everyone is here already. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the February event of uh, Bayer Network Virtualization. <laughs> Without taking much time, I would like to say uh, thanks to our sponsors and people who are evangelizing for the group. Uh, to that context, two people have really helped us for this event, Provoker from Fabric and Jay from Symantec. Symantec uh, uh, is providing the venue and all the support, and Fabric is covering all the food and drinks this pizza and beyond that also. So big thanks to all of you for sponsoring this activity. This is like totally we are doing that no cost, uh, no work base. We are just running so we can learn technology. And so, so to that extent, if you guys have any ideas or speakers, do come and talk to us, okay? And do not wait till the last minute. Because we have a backlog currently of two to three months of speakers and companies already lined up. If you see there's a new company which is coming up with a good product in networking or there is a tutorial you guys want to learn, come and talk to us because now we can go and approach speakers and we can invite them and use this platform. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll give the mic to Prabhakar and uh, Rajan. Prabhakar and Rajan, they're a team, so it, it is fine to overlap. But I'll give it to Rajan and then to Jay so they'll tell about themselves a little bit what Fabric and Symantec, how they're involved with the group. Uh, over to Rajan. Thanks, Vikram. Uh, as the fabric goes, uh, I explain to people that we uh, we are not a next generation clothing company. We are actually a networking related organization. So the fabric itself is a unique uh, organization, uh, the one of its kind in the valley. Uh, we uh, help entrepreneurs in creating companies in the cloud infrastructure space as well as the virtualization, data center virtualization area. Our essential, uh, our essence of the focus is in the networking space. Therefore, we are very happy and very pleased to be associated with this uh, event. And we uh, intend to continue to sponsor more of these events and, uh, and uh, uh, continue to associate the entrepreneurs. And we are very, very happy to be associated with the entrepreneurs in this event. So I want to, even though I was called Prabhakar, Prabhakar stands behind. <laughs> he, he is the is the brain behind the event, uh, uh, the, the, behind the fabric. So uh, if any of you have interesting ideas and uh, <coughs> what makes us unique as the fabric is that we have a, our core focus is in the networking space uh, or more importantly in the cloud infrastructure space. And we have created four companies. We are a co-creation company. People ask us, are you, are you incubators? The answer is yes. Uh, do you invest? The answer is yes. But we are a lot more. We have, uh, for example, an innovation lab, which creates uh, a bunch of uh, fundamental intellectual property blocks, which entrepreneurs can easily leverage to accelerate the process. We also have a set of people who work with us to help define the go-to-market, the strategy, the pricing models, the architectural elements of the products that need to be created. We also help pull together the teams that are needed to make a company successful. We have created four companies in the space. Uh, many of them, all of them are in the stealth. One of them will be on, uh, coming out pretty soon. And uh, it has got 25 customers. And the way the process started was this one person who walked up to us and said, I have an idea for van virtualization. And the conversation started with that, and we helped put together an entire team and <laughs> helped get the product concept going, got funded by one of the leading VCs in the Valley, and now it's a team of 30 people, and the product is getting uh, close to getting launched with 25 customers. This, <laughs> and besides that, we helped put together the, a full uh, test infrastructure to help test their products and also the go-to-market effort and at the end of the day, helping also acquire customers for them. And uh, that is what we do. And if any, since this is an audience, which I'm sure there are very good entrepreneurs over here who are thinking of efforts. In fact, one of them uh, is a friend of mine who walked and said, 
Platinum working in the data center analytics space. And guess what? I said, why don't you come and talk to us? Because we are working in that area. So these are some of the things that we do. So uh, with that, uh, I am again uh, very, very, very pleased to associate our brand uh, with this meetup. Uh, when, when I spoke first with Vikram, I didn't know him. I just happened to run into him at a meetup. And I said, Vikram, would love to sponsor this. And he said, guess what? Come on over. I need sponsors. So I'm very happy to be associated uh, with uh, with this and uh, Prabhakar and I. Uh, by the way, if you want to reach us, you can. Uh, the website is thefabricnet.com. So please feel to reach out and reach us if you're interested. Thanks. Thanks, Rajan. So now I uh, invite Jay from Semantic uh, uh, to share what his viewpoint is to invite all of us here. Thanks, Vikram. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, you know, Semantic is super excited to partner with uh, the Meetup Group, Pika8, and the Fabric uh, for this event. Um, my name is Jay, and I'm with the Cloud Platform Group. And uh, at Cloud Platform, we are doing something super exciting here, and uh, we're investing heavily in OpenStack Hadoop. Uh, as well as SDN, and, the com and our group is building a company-wide uh, platform as a service uh, for all uh, semantic applications. So, and our group is expanding, and uh, you know, if you're interested, you can talk to me, or uh, you have some flyers over there, and you can also talk to Bella. Uh, she's in the room. Um, so, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jake. So, guys. Uh, uh, there are a lot of job postings which are coming up on the discussion board, okay? So if you are looking for a job and you want to talk to directly with the hiring managers, just go and check out the discussion board. <coughs> I think Symantec has already posted a lot of jobs, there are a lot of data centers and um, all other companies I saw, like a bunch of companies who are starting to post jobs. So, so you don't have to go to recruiter or someone, just go and talk to the hiring manager, see if there's a match, and it's best for you guys, okay? So over, over to the main event of the day, um, it is with great honor, you know, to have Pika 8 and David Wright to come and give a talk. Uh, the history of this group goes back to the first talk when we invited James Liao. Uh, it was like a rainy day, uh, 15 to 20 people, Hacker Dojo, old, old Hacker Dojo, and that's where we started this group, right? Discussions about like how the OBS was ported to the Pika 8 switches. And uh, today we have David with us. Pika 8 is the leaders in open flow based metal switches deployment uh, in the world. Uh, I personally know them, they have deployments in very large customers, we call them working on MPRS and traffic engineering, and I know that they, where they're involved is like leading edge technology. I, I daily see like David like scratching his head, like ideas, like challenges, like problems. I thought this is the best, right, because he did some deployments with data centers, and he's the chief architect of, of Pika 8. I said, David, you need to come here and share what you are going through right now, putting open flow in data centers. Uh, so, so we have, lucky to have David today. He has master's from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, and he has been engineering manager for big large networking companies. I don't want to even name there, but now he's working with the startup big guy and trying uh, really like a new forefront, like it's a revolution they are running, right? Okay, over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I'd like to say Vikram and Fabric and Symantec to organize this. Uh, so it's, it's a great uh, uh, event for friends and people who like OpenFlow or SDN to get together. So I released it, you know, a bunch of my friend, my old CEO, Harry, actually a couple of my customers. So today, let me just say this. So let's focus on the working part first, right? All your bugs and things need to be fixed. We'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so, um, like Vikram said, I think about a year ago, uh, James and I gave two presentations. I, I gave a presentation, I brought the PKA white boxes to the uh, Hacker Dojo. I kind of run through a, a how to configure the, the open V switch on the hardware, how to set up flow, how to configure bridges. I think I remember I. I brought my Linux laptop with a USB bridge and some USB to Ethernet cable around Wireshark and packet, uh, set up a couple of flows. 
So since then, I think it's about exactly one year ago. Now actually we have a couple customers actually take the open flow switches into the deployment and number of flows compared to the one in the demo, I, had, I think I had four flows I configured. Um, then they have like thousands of flows, um, close to 2,000 flows running in different tier of the switch. So today I will go over that. Um, by the way, if you have questions, just, just raise your hand. You don't need to wait for the end. Uh, make it as inter interactive as possible. So here's the topics. Um, uh, I will go over that. Um, so first, goes to some marketing uh, on the PKIA. So if you don't know PKIA, um, or if you may heard people call it PKIA different names, right? So we've been called like a white box vendor. Actually, we're not. We don't manufacture white box. I remember went to a customer. Uh, sit down, the first thing they say is, we're looking for a dumb box vendor that put a dumb network box into our network. So I responded, yes, we do produce dumb boxes, but it took a team of very smart people to make the box look dumb. Um, so we, we are actually a software company. Uh, even though today we bundle our software on white boxes with sell switches because the white box uh, market, we don't think it's mature enough to have that model you buy uh, white boxes and buy software. Uh, but one day, we'll be there. Uh, I know there are companies working in that model. Um, so we are a software company. We have two stacks on our, on our platform. Uh, it, it's a Linux platform and we support layer two, layer three stack, our own software. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we bought Zorp. It's an open source layer two, layer three stack. And since then, we changed a lot of stuff, made the production ready. Uh, and then we have open flow stack. Uh, we use the open flow V switch. We pull the OBS virtual switch onto um, the hardware platform. Right? We take out the kernel module that do uh, flow manipulation inside the uh, IP stack, but we put it on the, uh, the actual hardware. Um, the V switch version uh, in the current release is the source code is 1.9 that we support open flow spec uh, version 1.3 and we're in the transition of porting um, the 2.0 source code which has multi thread support and a bunch of uh, improvement and trying to support open flow 1.4 uh, in Q2. Okay. So today the focus is really on the open flow stack. And the number of lines of code between the open flow stack and the layer two, layer three stack is huge. I mean, it's really a few percent of the, uh, the, the code, code size. So make it very slim, very easy to improve. That's why we have very fast releases. Um, so. Okay, so these are the, the, the platform we're offering. I, I won't go over the, the detail. So today, um, I will talk about the story that we took those platforms that from the lab into production. Okay, so uh, last year we have probably over 200 customers who bought our switches, but very few deployments. Okay, so there's a reason for that. So hopefully through today's discussion, I will share some of the issues, and hopefully people who is interested in going to open flow deployment, it will go out of the lab and go into production. Okay, so hopefully this presentation will help you to make those decisions and <coughs> understand what it takes to, to go through those deployment. Okay. So um, this presentation is about a customer we have um, and they want to design a, a greenfield data center okay, uh, in New York. I uh, support Wall Street applications. Um, and they want to have a pure open flow design. Right? Very hard to find people who take that plan to say, even though I have all these constraints, but I want to work through the constraint because I know I can benefit from a white box and open flow switch platform. So they went through the, the, the whole design development cycle and we kind of step by step with them. Um, so, Today I won't talk about the server, the, the VM, or the uh, other part, I'll just focus on the network design. Okay, so it's a Greenfield white box data center. Um, then 
day one when I met with their team and the CEO, they said, I don't want to have any legacy in the data center. Okay. No portal calls, no nothing. I just want a pure open flow control network. I said, great. Um, there's no flooding. I'm sorry. V6? Uh, basically, it's not supported right now. Uh, okay. Uh, I uh, know their network does not support V6, but ours we support V6. But if you want to run V6, there's some limitation in terms of TCAM, number of TCAMs you can do because it takes two, two entries. Um, okay, flawless network, no flooding, no multi casting, no, no broadcasting. Uh, they want to have very simple control. Simple, but they want to have com complete control over the entire data center. They want to control the IP address scheme. Okay. They want to control the forwarding decisions. Oh, it's sorry. It's white and blacklist. Right? So if you if you look at the open flow uh, model, the only forward pack is based on the flow you put into the to the, to the switch. Uh, so it's kind of whitelist, but they also have a bunch of security concerns and they use that uh, open flow to implement the blacklist as well. They have a complete control over the topology and to be able to scale. Uh, and they want to have the control over the, the architecture for controller and a bunch of other things that we'll talk about. Okay. Maximum visibility. Um, so I remember the meeting with the CEO, he sit down with us, right? He said the CEO used to run big call center with incumbent equipment, right? So when the network is down, he said, "There's no one can tell him exactly what happened to the network. Right? The entire support staff, entire the, the staff, I, um, the tech, technical staff on the on the incumbent company look at the network, but no one can tell him exactly what, what happened to the network." Okay. So then he spent one week after the network is recovered. He spent one week sit down with the IT staff or network staff, goes through every command, CLI command they use they use to configure the network. Right? So then, you come to a conclusion, it's amazing with that complexity, the way they configure the routing. It's amazing that it will even work. Okay. So, so now he started this new company. This, this uh, Greenfield is a, 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 a um, startup data center company. Um, so one of the decisions he made is he wants a complete visibility of the network when switch make decision for packet and when not to forward packet. Okay. And he wants 100% automation uh, for the network. So those are the kind of the, the design goals that uh, he has. Right. So um, okay. So starting with the, the constraints. So we have 200 plus customers. <coughs> right. So after the customer buy the switches, after they use it, goes through the initial cycle. The first thing or a lot of time they ask, well, what is the, the key can size? How big key can table I can play? Right. So my standard answer is depends on the model. So for a 10G switch on Trident Plus is 1,000 entries. Um, on the 1G switch um, using the Firebolt or Trion, which is 2,000 uh, entries. Uh, we have a Trident 2 coming up, it's 2,000 entries. So usually there are two responses. Most responses, well, that's not enough. I said, I know that's not enough. Right. But this customer, I want to pay, this customer is, they understand all this constraint, but they say, David, how do I work around this? Right. So let's design a data center with all this constraint. Let's work through all this constraint, see what I can do. Okay. So, so that's the first constraint, TCAM size. The next constraint is, um, there's no open switch, open flow ASIC. Right? The open flow switch is built on top, let's say, the most common one, Broadcom platform. It's a layer two, layer three ASIC. Right? So a lot of the open flow concept defined for the soft switch doesn't fit well with the ASIC pipeline. Right? So for example, if that's a typical pipeline, you terminate the tunnel, you, you go to layer three, learning, it goes to the layer three entry table to do routing. It goes to the ingress ACL. Um, then it goes through the, the metering. I mean, this is a, this is a pipeline. So most of the implementation today, open flow switch, they use ACL because that's a TCAM 
which we have a flexible, you can match on layer two and layer three. That's what OpenFlow is specified. Right? Then you can do action. Uh, but then there's a bunch of features <coughs> that defined in the, the OpenFlow model cannot be supported. So those are, those are really kind of serious constraints. Right? So multiple table, for example. I mean, because the limited TKM size, you like to have the multiple tables so you can reduce, you do multiple lookup so you can reduce the number of rules instead of one flat rule. But multiple table is very hard to support uh, because TCAM is one region, even come with slices, uh, but the lookup is, is just one, uh, one lookup. Right? Um, so for example, so one question we solve in this deployment is how do I, for example, this is one of the hundred issues that, that we, we kind of work together. So how do I forward based on, for example, um, uh, destination IP address, but at the same time I want to do queuing. Right? So, so each, each, each destination IP address go to a server, I only have eight queues, but in the current open flow, the way you specify rules, then if one destination IP forwarding, you have eight queues, you do eight set queues, and it'll be eight, eight flows. How do I solve that issue? Um, no positive act after four months. So that's why issue if we, we submit a, a feature request to one app. Because today, once you do a flow mod and store a flow, you can you don't have a act positive denial. If you look at the, the spec, you basically assume you get there and get restored. But if it fails, then you get a notification. So we have to continuously do flow stat to to um, to retrieve the status to make sure the flow is installed correctly. Right. So, so that caused some issue because initially when you bring up the controller, when you bring up the open flow switches, most of the cases you install a bunch of static flow, right? Uh, uh, based on the things you know how you want to route. Uh, so and some of the flow depends on whether you install the earlier previous flow successful or not. So in this model, in the current open flow 1.3, uh, writing a controller logic is very hard, right? So you do a chunk of write, um, then you have to go figure out what, what the status is and go into that. So it's very hard to, to, to do a kind of state machines that handle this type of scenario. So, so all these constraints, when I say starting constraints, when, when we work with the customer in April 2013, that's the, the status of our switch. I think our switch was 1.6, 1.7. Today we're in 2.2. So I, I will go through kind of all the things we did to kind of improve all this constraint uh, to deployment. Uh, open for version 1.2, we support at that time. Ah, so there's a group table. So if you have uh, aggregation layer and top rack configuration, right? So the port, the uplink from the top rack to the aggregation layer, you want to have, normally you configure as ECMP, but uh, in a layer two, layer three. But open flow, really, there is no kind of ECMP concept. Uh, at that time, when there is a group table, uh, if you use a group table select type, it's kind of emulate what ECMP function is. But if you look at the switching pipeline, ECMP is the layer three functionality handle in the layer three pipeline, not handle in the, in the ACL TCAM, right, where you program rules. I mean, you can fake it. I mean, we, we, we did something with but it's not very efficient, it wastes a lot of flow entry. Um, fast fail over, once you configure ECMP, you want to do load balancing, because from top of rack to aggregation, you usually have a redundant link, so you want to do load balancing, and one link is time, you want to do a fast fail over. It's all the features that traditional switch that support, that make it work. But in open flow, we need to map, make sure that works on the open flow, this simple control model as well. Uh, zero touch provisioning uh, to make it production, so you want to be able to put the box from the stock room, put on the rack, and power around so you download the software and upgrade. Metering, so all those features that when they started, or when we started with them, not there. But the point I want to make is you want to go into production with OpenFlow, you do believe OpenFlow, we have to go through kind of a step by step. You have to work through all the constraints. You have to design that. Okay. Now, so the first thing is scale. Okay. So I mean, 
we spent a lot of time to figure out how to scale with open flow with limited TKM entry. Okay. Um, so I can jump ahead though, even though it's 1K or 2K flow entry, but we did a bunch of optimization. So now on the 1G switch, we can do uh, 4,000 uh, 4, entry, but still not enough. So how do you scale <coughs> under the open flow constraint? So that's <coughs> the first thing we, we went over. Uh, I remember um, they went through their own design, then they asked me to go do the reveal. Then they have this whiteboard has seven layers of multiple tables. They have seven multiple tables. Right? They have everything designed out, uh, how to do each filtering at, at each stage, right? So when I go there, I look at that, so I say, can I have an eraser? I erase from two to seven. I said, that's the only table you have. Uh, let's figure out how to work. So, so, so scaling is, 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 a, is a, probably the first one you have to go through in your data center design. Okay, so what does that mean? So now I talk about the, the flow entries number of flow entries, right? Then because the white box, so there's a limited number of ports. So let me just give you a sample configuration uh, here, right? So you have the, the core layer, you have the aggregation layer, you have the top rack layer. So top rack has 48 port, um, then going to aggregation. Aggregation has 48 port. So then going to core and connect to multiple data centers with uh, multiple NG <coughs> ports. So the first thing we did is, is we define, well, the first thing is um, we kind of reach a agreement that you cannot scale your architecture like the traditional layer two, layer three, where you want to grow indefinitely with the fabric, right? So open flow, you can build, <coughs> excuse me, you can build a fabric, but there is a limitation on how to scale. Okay, so once we reach that, Understanding and uh, 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 conclusion, then the thing is very easy. Okay, so basically, we kind of define a scaling unit with um, the focus on aggregation. So aggregation layer, two aggregation, each aggregation, <coughs> each each. Um, So uh, each aggregation layer support 12 racks. So, um, and each rack has two top rack switch with 40 servers. Right, so then their uh, 48 port, their auto port, and they use that to connect to their uh, management network. So each server, each switch, their management port is connect to uh, another IPMI network with another switch, and switch connect back to the top rack so they can learn uh, the management address, they can do a bunch of stuff. Anyway, so, so this is a scaling unit um, in terms of how you grow based on <coughs> the flow. Okay, now how do you grow? So if that's a scaling unit, uh, let's say 12 racks, right, uh, with two aggregations. Now, you can build third tier fabric I mean, you can, you can grow that, right? Uh, but it's complicated, they wanna keep it simple. So what they decided to do is, that's a scaling unit, then I will have multiple scaling unit, connect them together through n by 10 Gs, uh, links. So they, they do the, the traffic engineering, so you can imagine this is one node. Oh. So this is one node uh, for the scaling unit. Then what they do is, then they have a multiple of this configured in a, in a, in a topology. <coughs> okay, so in, in, a, in, a, in a topology then, between each node they connect through n by 10 G links. So David, if I understand right, you're saying there are 12 <coughs> racks in one of these groups. Right. Is the topology of the tor through the core layer um, a fat tree? Or is it something else? 
Uh, no, in this deployment, no. They did not go through that complexity. They just want to keep it simple. simple. So basically, um, 12 red. So, okay, so let me. So 40 server use up 40 port on the top of rack, right? Okay, so on the top of rack, uh, on the on the uh, on the top of rack, there's uh, four 10G port, right? So so they'll have 20G, two 10G port to each of the aggregation configured as the ECMP group for low balancing and. Uh, uh, fast fail over. Uh, so that pretty much use, if 12 reg you do the mass is about, uh, you use up 48 port. Right? So, so each reg has uh, two 10G to that, right? So you have two top of regs, so you use four, the 10G port. Then so that each aggregation switch can only support 12 regs. In your customer uh, use cases, right, or maybe even in this case, use case, how are your customers uh, doing storage? Uh, do they uh, do they maintain a separate network? Was there any requirement that for FCOE kind of uh, situations? Um, it seems like this is just only support internet, no storage, right? No FC. Right. So um, storage storage is actually connected to the uh, switch as well through. Uh, Ethernet link. Uh, so it's uh, connected to Maybe it's all 10G. Nice. So it, I'm sorry? Is it, uh, see, in SAN, uh, typically we uh, need the fiber channel connectivity, right? Oh, so, so this one it is Ethernet. So come out at uh, file server, it's come out at uh, multiple uh, gigabit Ethernet or connect to the switch. So, okay, so, so now that. Hope that the mess is clear. So, two 10G4 per top of rack. So, for two top of rack, take four 10, take four 10G4 on the aggregation. So, 48 divided by four, so 12 racks. Okay. I mean, you we could do, actually we are in the lab, um, we are doing a factory configuration for another fabric, uh, but the complexity there is a lot more. So. Here they want to keep it simple, right? So instead of using a factory, building a fabric so we can grow indefinitely, they say, I don't want to do that. I just want to have a very single unit, but I want to scale in a, di in a different way. So we'll have a limitation how they scale. So you can imagine if this is one node, then you can connect uh, three or four of those nodes together, right? form a topology. Okay, so here, so that's why I have one clock. So one clock means there's a couple of these nodes connected together. Okay. Now, how do you scale? So so that's one unit, one topology unit. Okay, so there's a scaling unit, then when you connect <coughs> multiple nodes together become a topology, that's a topology unit. So now instead of Build the fabric so this topology, flat topology, can scale indefinitely. They scale this way, right? Okay. So, wh what does it mean? So that topology become a, a unit when they scale. So when they turn on, when they build more uh, uh, capacity, they put more customers. They need to have more. Uh, they want to scale. They do one car at a time. So it's all kind of pre-configured, pre-installed. That's it. So that's a scaling unit. You, there's no flexibility. Today you roll a rack to the data center, wire them up, and turn on the fabric. That's it. So they want to simplify the operations. So that's what they did. I'm not saying this is the best way. Uh, it's a very simple way uh, that under the open flow constraint. So, so that's why I have multiple cloud there. So, so once you have the scaling unit, you configure a topology based on each of the scaling functions. So, uh, what's the subscription level you have? One is to do it in this case. Uh, the over subscription level that you have in this case, one is to do it. Oh, okay. So, the 
uh, top rank for this data center is 1G, so, so, so 48 1G to 4 uh, 10G, so on the top rank subscription rate it's kind of 1 to 1. Um, then from aggregation layer to the core, um, there is uh, 48, 10, 48 10G and 4 40 G, so there from the subscription 1 to 3. I'm sorry? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, so, so that's how you scale. Define a unit, define a topology, and you scale the entire topology one at a time. Okay, hopefully that, you can, you can get that concept. Then, um, <coughs> okay, so on the core, the core is also 4810G, right? So, but from aggregation, to core, you're not using all the 10G port. So those spare ports are used to cross-connect between each of the clouds. Right, so give you that connectivity for, uh, uh, this is three-dimensional traffic, it's not east-west, anyway. So inter-data center, okay, so inter-data center between core there, but core can talk to other core through this topology. Uh, question? So if you need more than three, and you want to scale a certain layer, <coughs> how do you scale that layer? Oh, uh, yeah, you can go more than three. But then, um, it's not a mesh, right? So between each cloud, uh, or each that topology configuration, or let's say a ring configuration, or square configuration, uh, between the vertex, between the point of the, the, the ring or the, or the square, the fixed number of uh, uh, bandwidths go between that. Okay. So, um, so you don't have an any to any connectivity, uh, but you have fixed number of bandwidths connect from, from each of the two parts, from each of the ring, from each of the, 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 the square. Uh, so, so that's the second thing. After you figure out how to scale based on the application, right, um, based on yeah, based on the application, based on the type of traffic, you have to go through traffic engineering to figure out the traffic pattern, <coughs> so you can define a topology or scaling configuration network. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so so once we defined uh, the scaling architecture, and once we did the, the mass, um, you know, figure out uh, <coughs> traffic the work, the next thing we do is, I won't go over the, the rule by rule, uh, but the, the next step is really to figure out how do you do traffic forwarding in open flow PSN. Okay, so that's the, the second most difficult part, the longest part that we spent uh, um, to figure out how to route traffic. So, <clears throat> what, what does that mean? If you remember, one of the uh, criteria is they want to have uh, full visibility of the network. Right? So for this open flow, we can do that because whatever you install on the switch to forward packet based on the matching action, whatever rules you put on to drop packet, it's there. But the question is, what rules you want to put in there based on the constraint you have on open flow switches? How do you use, let's say, bit mask um, IP address to reduce the number of flow entry you want? <coughs> so there's a set of design is going to to design the um, <coughs> the IP address scheme so you can use the number of rules, right? So you, you can't have a way to assign IP address randomly because if you do that, the flow entry won't be enough, okay? So, um, so the second step you have to go through is lay down, once you have the architecture, you have laid down all the things you would do in the data center operation from IP address, MAC address, 
um, security, um, forwarding decision, um, between racks, uh, inside the racks, going to gateway, going to internet, uh, traffic coming back, um, how to prevent loops, um, how do we handle ARPs, how do we handle broadcasts, how do we handle multicast, um, how do you learn, right? So you can, you can figure out all the things you need in so on open for switch, right? So I kind of did analysis um, because we write a controller ourselves as well. Most of the time, you probably write a controller and handle 70% of the situation, right? Uh, those 30% you don't know. Okay, how do we handle those? Uh, anyway, so, so just some of the example for the top red rules, uh, drop rules, usually um, we do drop first. Right? So we drop all the things we know we don't want. We don't wait for the default. We just drop everything. Like in this case, uh, IPDC, <coughs> drop first. <laughs> Okay, um, then we do learning because um, uh, there are a bunch of stuff happen in the network that you can pre-configure, for example, uh, putting a new server, right? So the new server will send out, let's say, R, um, then you have to learn that IP address. Right? So the R SPA field will give you the IP address for that new server. Uh, but then you need to validate, right? Is it a valid server that's supposed to come from this port? Uh, so you, so there's a bunch of learning you need to do. Then you want to learn all the management port because people want to come in, manage the switches. Uh, remember, all the server management port and the switch management port connect to a very cool <coughs> switch that you feed back to the top rack switch. Right? So top rack switch will get a bunch of IP address from the management port. and like that. Um, then forwarding. So forwarding actually is the easiest part, but you still need to lay out, right? So when a new server is for so in, in those topology they will configure the, the all the switches, all the top rack switch, all the aggregation switch in one unit going, right? Then then they will plug plug in the server. Uh, then for example when server plugin you need to set a rules. Right, so we need a set of rules to forward traffic from the server to internet, to um, gateway, to another VEX, or to another server. Right, so there's a, there's a set of rules. Okay. So you see there, do I put there? Um, It's not here. Uh, anyway, so so if you remember the the, the, the topology, right? So from <coughs> top of rack to aggregation. So basically, the rule is very simple. Um, for packet coming to the top of rack, it's not in this rack. I will forward to the logical group I create, right? The select group, because the select group is the the two link, the multiple links going to the aggregation, right? So. So basically, the forwarding decision is very simple. If the packet is coming here and going to another server, I will do local switching. If it's not, I will forward, I will forward to the group that I created with ECMP feature going to aggregation. I will just go to the aggregation. Now, aggregation will make a simple decision um, which rec is going forward to. Okay. So, so that's kind of an example, but the, the, the point I want to make is when you design data center, you use open flow switch, that's the next step you want to do. You want to lay off the entire data center and at each stage, you want to define all the forwarding rules and you want to go optimize. Okay, again, even though we optimize on the top of red 4,000 entries, the aggregation, the 10 G switch is only 2,000 entries. <coughs> So usually there's a set of drop rules. You want to drop the learning. Uh, you do dynamic rule installation, and you do basic forwarding. So that's the top of right. Okay, aggregation. Uh, so for top of right, um, with that architecture, about 
1,600 uh, 1600 rules uh, roughly in, in, during testing. 1,600 rules on top of it. Um, so we still have some room to grow. Okay, aggregation. Uh, aggregation uh, layer actually it's easier if you remember that topology. Really, traffic coming from top of rack is a very simple decision. Um, look at uh, the, the IP address or the mask. Decide which rack it's going to. Right? It's forward to the top rack uh, of, of other rack. Now, if traffic is going out, then forward to another group uh, going to the border, uh, going to the, the core. So they will make those decisions. So the entire forwarding decision is breaking into segments. Right? So you have to lay out the, the network at the top rack, aggregations, and the core, and figure out how you optimize routes. Yes? So at the aggregate, you have a less specific rule, and at the core, you have a more specific rule. That's what you're trying to do, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so at the aggregation layer, it's all what I the ECMP group, right? So the moment you see, ah, this address is target for that rack, I send it to that, send it to that group. So, so my VM migration is with, within that set of uh, racks. Um, okay, so VM migration is, gets similar treatment like the IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, so right now there's uh, very small VM migration happen, right? Uh, if I tell you they don't even believe VM, <laughs> it's, it's waste. Uh, anyway, so they, they do run the KVN and a lot of stuff. But the VM migration, I think, I don't know, I mean, from their perspective, there's no need. So, um, but it, it doesn't mean it cannot be handled. So you move to you move one VM to another VM depends. So you can learn. So the rules I talk about, right? So in the controller will learn this new VM, move from here to there. Um, depends if you keep the same IP address, then it's a different set of learning. If you have a new IP address, you start a new VM with new <coughs> IP address, and you learn that IP address, and you do a separate rule. So. So those things can be defined, can be handled. I I have a question. Not. So who does the optimization here in terms of the TKM entries and what goes that program? Is it is it from the controller level or is it from the switch? Ah, okay. So ah. there are multiple levels. So TKM optimization I talk about to go from 1,000 entry on the 10G switch to 2,000 entries done by us. Okay. Right. So the, the switch. But yeah, by the switch, okay. by, by us. Um, so, so the TCAM optimization is really because it's a fixed size TCAM, right? So each size is multiple, uh, you have two entries. So if you don't need to use two entries, you can use one entry. If you just do uh, IP-based forwarding or Mac-based forwarding, then you just use one entry, so you can double the size. I mean, it's not magic, you just need to figure out how to do it. Now, the rule optimization, the flow optimization actually needs to be done between vendors and the customer work very closely together. Um, I mean, the, the design of the whole data center require kind of a, a teamwork um, because you really need to understand how the switch behave uh, before we can write the controller applications. Uh, so we kind of work together. So, are you able to, was it your controller? Did you mention that? Or are you able to reveal whose controller was fed with the feedback switches? Ah, okay, so controller question. Uh, let's wait until later. Um, so, where was I? All the secrets. Ah, okay, aggregation layer. Um, so aggregation layer, like I said, the decision is very simple after you drop everything you want. Um, then the forwarding is really based on the IP address and the, the, the mask. The mask, the big mask is a very useful feature when you design rules, because they help you reduce the number of entries if you use it correctly. Um, uh, so basically, just four to different groups. So all those groups, 53, 55, they are just um, uh, the, 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 op um, the open flow group, the select type, or we call ECMP, uh, that, that we implement. So 
Is there any reason why some of the flow have uh, lower priority in this case? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, so priority is kind of a uh, tricky thing. So, yeah, so you also want to define priority. Uh, so drop is always the first priority. Now, for any decisions, um, so in this case, actually, the priority doesn't matter because there's a unique match. But come to, uh, if you have rules that you match on similar field, then the priority becomes an a, a important uh, consideration. You want to make sure that the packet coming match the high priority one. So in this case, actually, because I kind of just randomly fill in some priorities, I just want to make it different. So, okay, so let's see. Top right. Um, ah, okay, so, so top right, so poor 49 to 52, that's the aggregation poor. So if you look at this rule, you'll know right away. Those are the traffic coming from outside going through the inner going through the aggregation and trying to go into the, um, the server, right? So coming through the, the uplink 49. So port 1 to 48 connect to the server and 49 50 connect to the aggregation layer. Then when you send that thing, uh, because or IP base, so you need to fill in the, the correct MAC address, otherwise the server will drop it. You want to fill in the, uh, the, the destination MAC address. Okay, so um, so I think once you have done those two steps, I think the most difficult part of the data center design, I think it, it, it's kind of behind. Now you need to verify the whole thing work, right? So then you need to find a controller and do that. So we'll talk about control later. Um, but before you reach to that point, so vendor, like us, we did a bunch of stuff to make sure the switch is production versus. Right? So, so like I said, we first we did the TCAM optimization. So now we support 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 entries. Depends on what model you use. We implement a group select ECMP. Okay. Uh, if you look at OpenFlow standard, there is a group function and they have a type called select. Um, and to implement ECMP. TCAM won't do it. So we have to figure out a way to enable the layer 3 features. So even though the pipeline processing is layer 3 than TCAM, so we spent some time figuring out how to enable that feature to for the ECMP. And to us, that's one of the most critical features to enable data center deployment because you, don't, you do want that load balancing and the failover mechanism to be there between the aggregation and the top right. Meter ring wasn't wasn't there a year ago. Now we have it. Uh, it's, it's 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 good, but the meter ring has meter ring. Meter is a feature in the TCAM, right? So if you have 256 entries in the TCAM, you have 256 meters. Um, so if you use meters, but meter only gives you kind of number of packets. It won't tell you ingress, egress, packet count. Uh, so there's certain limitations, but metering is still a very important feature that allow you to, to monitor the behavior. Testing the whole controller framework and... Uh, uh, Are you supporting hierarchical meters? No, uh, we treat it like the IPv6, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, no hierarchical meters. Uh, so... Um, Pre-configure queuing, so, we, uh, so like I said earlier, so if you do destination IP forwarding and the packet coming to that destination IP has different type of priority, right? So because you <coughs> have into different application, database application versus VOIP applications versus other. They want to have a, a queue, just do a set queue, but it's very hard to do set queue with the TCAM limitation because then each destination you have to have eight entries or more. Um, so, so then we figure out a way to do pre-configure queuing so you don't need to waste the, the, the number of entries. Uh, uh, and then the DB. So, so some of the features here I discussed is not open flow uh, 
uh, specification. It's the feature that we kind of implement um, to enable production. And I think DB is, is a, a very critical feature. So um, actually a couple weeks ago, I was in China and they called me and said, um, what a pack if there's no packet going out. I said, well, did you drop everything? <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's the first question I had. Is that if you So, um, okay, so tell me what happened. So, they forgot to install a layer two drop rule, okay, uh, for a certain uh, Easter time. So, when they turn off full traffic and doing testing in the lab, uh, actually in, in, in the lab, so what happened is because you did not specify the drop rule, and in the open flow spec, what they say, the forward to the controller. Right. So, so top of rack, I just ran into the top of rack send packet to aggregation layer. Um, and aggregation layer forgot to put in a drop rule. So all those packets going to CPU. But if be, between the ASIC and the CPU is PCIe, the PCIe bus. So it has a limited bandwidth, right? So, when they start to flood the, uh, the CPU, because the CPU connect to the ASIC on another port. So the ASIC said, hey, this port is con congested. And guess what happened? They do flow control. So the flow control is able to send the flow control over to the source, which is going to the top of rack. Right? The top of rack send packet going to aggregation layer, but aggregation layer <coughs> forgot to process that packet flood the CPU, so flow control uh, enable on the top of rack. So now all the packets, because the traffic, so they keep sending flow control, so top of rack, the packet buffer is full. Okay, so when the packet buffer is full, full nothing can go up. Okay, you can look at the entire open flow standard, you can look at the entire SMP MIP, or well, we don't even support SMP MIP. Uh, there's no way you can figure out. So what, what do you do? You have to look at the, the counters on the ASIC chip. Right? So there's a set of counters monitor the packet buffer. Right? So you open up the debug window for the Broadcom chipset. You look at the register, ha, ah, the packet buffer is full. Why the packet buffer is full? Then you trace back to figure out, ah, there's very simple. There's a one rule, drop rule denied, put in there. Okay. So what is the analytic DB? on the switch is the database that we implement that uh, capture all the Broadcom <coughs> registers. I don't want to say all the registers. I mean, all the counters, important counters. Let me say, put it this way. All the important counters. And we, we have, a, we file the Python that we can capture the, the, the counter at one second interval. Uh, so, so analytic DB, uh, export the important information that to the controller or to the operator so you can figure out what's going on. Okay, so uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. I think open flow, programming the flow, like I said, it's very simple, but how to figure out when things not working is most difficult. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to build tools to, to, to solve those issues. Uh, zero touch provisioning, I talked about Event reporting, uh, switch inventory. Um, uh, event reporting is important. If you look at the open flow standard, they give you a certain event or status change, right? For uh, link up and down, flow removal, group table deleted, uh, table mismatch, mis table miss event, and a bunch of stuff. Uh, but then there other stuff is it's, it's not it's not defined. The environmental stuff, right? So the CPU usage. Well, OBS DB has that um, CPU usage or the um, um, uh, uh, fans and temperatures and other stuff, right? So, so those event reporting is critical for production because they need to monitor that. Uh, but we don't want to take a traditional SMP. You put the SMP agent on the switch, then it's, it's a waste. The SMP code is probably more than open focal. Um, <laughs> So, so we designed, uh, we actually, we designed a, a set of table using the OBS DB structure to report those events. <coughs> it's configurable, you can configure the threshold, 
If it's threshold, generally you're going to get better severity, so you can do traditional alarm processing. Right? Um, switch inventory. Oh, sorry. So you have your own schema for OVSDB? Uh, extension. Ex extension to OVSDB. Actually, I'm writing something so I can submit to uh, David Hood uh, Architecture Group as an extension. Um, so it's not in competition with OF config, but uh, it, we think it's a simpler way of, of doing management of the, the switch. So let's see where it goes. There's another. Are you talking about any kind of structured log that you would, that you would export? Either be go to a file or be a syslog or something like that, and that you could actually tune to diagnostic information. Yes. So, yeah, syslog function is, is implemented. So the actually the the configurable event reporting those events you can configure a receiver to receive those events, or you go into syslog then you, you collect those syslog. And are you doing these detailed attributes? Oh, in the analytic DB? Absolutely. No, not in syslog. Um, those are a different mechanism to export those data. It's, it's a lot of data, right? So let's say um, about 100 counters per port, right? Each one will keep kind of 8 byte, uh, then 52 <coughs> ports plus some other stuff. There's queues and there other things. Capture so if you want to capture every second, uh, it's a lot of data. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I would assume you didn't want to do that. You probably want to aggregate something or different levels of aggregation. So, you would turn on no aggregation if you want to get deep. I could understand right. there's a problem, but having some aggregation, maybe good enough. Uh, <coughs> so, I won't call aggregation because the, the counters export kind of flat. Right, but then there's a select select mechanism allowing you to select a, a subset of counters. I agree. Let me rephrase that. Useful statistics, useful analytics that you could embed in there so that you know where a table's getting too big or something like that. They give you some indication ahead of time downstream. Oh, uh, okay, okay. I mean, that, those are those are analytics that I think that are very simple that you could get off a switch like this and be able to toss it somewhere. Ah, uh, a good point. Somewhere. Right. So if you want to do alarm suppression, for example, and things like that, right? Yeah, so exactly. yeah. So those yeah. So you can configure those and export to your you know, management system and yeah. So they they can they can do that up. Ah, but the question is, where do you do that, right? So. Uh, I have one slide talk about the, the demo manager, we can discuss that. Sure. Uh, I, I would hope that that would eventually get to be a standard within um, diagnostics. Because I don't yeah, think so I'm that would be a good idea. How do you fix this stuff when it breaks? But I agree that, uh, that's a good idea. So that situation that you ran into, are you working that into some future solutions so the customers on the call you find out that they have source control? Flow control. Oh, the flow control. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's what analytic DB provides. So, so it's a flat data. We haven't, we haven't had time, um, we haven't had time to 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 build next level two. But there are a bunch of ideas we have that we can build a bunch of stuff that help people to do that faster. Yeah. So that's that's the number one key issue. Um, Switch inventory, uh, for example, plug, pluggable plug-in inventory. Right? So you want to do the optics inventory, so that's important information for you to figure it out. Um, and crossbow mode, actually. OK, so, so let me spend a bit of time. Um, so interworking between OpenFlow and layer two layer three network never been defined well, right? So in OpenFlow, Back, there's this kind of ship and deny hybrid mode. Right? Everybody has a different interpretation of hybrid mode. And we have at least three different hybrid mode implementations uh, <coughs> that we release to customers and never go anywhere. So, so the only thing I want to mention this is now we have a new implementation. Whoever is interested in this, buy our switch and try it out. But basically, um, instead of Ship and I um, that 
that uh, the layer two, layer three stack and the open flow stack that they don't talk to each other. We kind of design a way to have a pore based configuration so you can have cross float mode, we will call it cross flow. Um, so you can have an open flow network with this set of four, then those will be controlled by the open flow controller and the TCAN rules. And some of the four you can configure with pure open flow control, that's called cross flow local control. Right? So the, the local control layer to layer three stack does not intervene with those packets. Or you can say cross flow local control on, which means that's where the that's where the interesting part come in. They will go into TCAN and also go into the layer two layer three table. Then you have the legacy now. Okay. So <coughs> it is a, a kind of complicated configuration. Uh, we're playing with it. We have customers playing with it, but uh, I don't know where it's going to be end up. Uh, but that's again. Uh, we kind of developed this feature because uh, inter data center um, forwarding, uh, there's many options. Right? You can do static route, you just use open flow, that core layer, or you can enable, for example, BGP to broadcast route between data centers. So this feature is we developed to do that. Um, then the other solution is you run BGP outside, like, um, on the controller uh, to terminate all the the, the BGP route, then figure out how to route traffic. What does it mean? Uh, because I remember you said like you want to eliminate multitasking and broadcast, but then you have the middle box that is legacy overlap with. Right. So, uh, so in pure open flow <laughs> design for that data center, we eliminate all the broadcast and multicast. Uh, but yes, but if you use cross flow mode, then yes, you will get those broadcast packet, but hopefully those packet coming will go through the port that has either local control on, or it will go into the layer two, layer three uh, stack, or go into the legacy port. Uh, but if you go to the TCAM port, we just drop them like IP G6. Right? So we just define a rule with F or F and just drop. Uh, so these ports are all like we can yeah, so this is in one switch, <coughs> that's a good point. So the cross flow board will work on the switch, on the same switch, so allow the two network into work <coughs> together. So who decides what to send what? Is the uh, controller like, essentially making a decision? Ah, and okay, right. So packet coming through legacy network, it will hit the fifth and uh, the forwarding database and route table, right? So packet coming, they will get routed there. If you look at the pipeline, layer two, layer three, then the ACL, and then the TCAM. Now, packet coming in from open flow will go into TCAM here around right there. Right? Okay, now I got something. How do you know it's coming from open flow? Oh, because you define a set of ports. It's port based. Okay. So this fine. time we implement port based. Before, we implement VLAN based um, hybrid mode. Um, and the, the packet coming on the cross flow okay. port with local control on, right. then you will hit both. So then, there are different ways you can do that, so. Uh, then the TK. Right, so. Uh, don't, don't use the code. Because I have to support you. Uh, yeah, so we will hit the layer 2, layer 3, then the TCAM. But in this way, TCAM has precedence, right? So. So one application you can do is, for example, um, you can identify special type of flow <coughs> that you do special processing. Because you know, once you hit the routing table in the layer two, layer three, you just get routed. But then you can install open flow rule for certain things uh, in a routing network, but you want to split them out and perform special processing. That's one application that we can think of. Do you need to maintain any consistency between the TCAM and the uh, project? Yeah, so when you do this, yeah, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know there's no overlap, right? So the, 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 the rules, the route, because even legacy packet coming, going through route table is still hit TCAM, because that's the switching pipeline, right? So, um, so you have to design your rule carefully, make sure you don't have that uh, 
uh, conflict. Anyway, so it's it's a it's an interesting area that we have customers using it, and uh, we'll see maybe a couple months later we we'll do a different implementation. Uh, so, so the cross flow basically will go into the decant first, and then if it doesn't find a match or some sort, it will go to other credit Uh Yes, for the for the yeah for the cross flow, yes, we're going to actually for pure decant for pure open flow, right? Cross flow local control off. Those are just going to TCAM. Yep, right. For cross flow local control on, they will hit both table. And you want to make sure that you don't have conflict. Okay, but no priority. Uh, TCAM always take priority. Okay. If, if there's no entry, we we'll go to the ASM controller. You assume like the active or reactive type of. Oh, so. Um, yeah, so. I mean, so expect, but yeah, so the TCAM behave like this for <coughs> open flow specified. <laughs> So if you don't have an entry for D4 drug, right, so uh, uh, if you don't have an entry to capture the, the, the packet, it will get dropped if you don't have a, a D4 rule there. But then if you want the packet going to the controller, you need to specify that. So you have, for example, you have a low priority one wildcard rule and going to the controller. But you have a very specific. You have to be very careful for packet to control because there's a limited number of packets you can send a controller to a flooded, uh, I'm sorry, to a flooded CPU. But now we implement some mechanism to make sure it's, it won't happen, but still. Design your rule carefully, don't, yeah. Controller. Um, okay. So controller, okay, now that you went, you went through all this design cycle, then now you understand Everything you want to implement in the in the overflow controller, so then you do a controller. So they decided to do a in-house um, You know, we catch we kind of went back back and forth many times, <coughs> and they talked to many different control vendors. Right? So, but none of them the, the the problem today from their perspective, not my perspective. So it's hard to find a controller vendor really understand the data center operation or the, that specific application. So how do you write a controller for this customer that do their bread and butter data center operation by another company? I mean, the logic doesn't work. Right? So especially this CEO, he wants complete visibility, complete control over so that he doesn't have that problem that when since not working in the network, no one can tell you what happened. Um, so, so this company decided to build their own controller. Okay. So, um, then they did not use any of the controller frameworks. Um, so they have a very stripped down version, the OpenFlow portal called Parser, and they build everything themselves. Okay. And guess how long it takes? Less than a year. I started working with them in April. Now going to deployment. Okay. To me. I, I, I kind of step through the whole development cycle with them. I mean, to me, that's a really a success story because they understand the, the, their application logic and they implement their own controller and they do not take any control framework. Um, and um, uh, the development time is really less than a year. Very few people, a handful of people, less than a handful of people. Question: I see OVSDB here, and you also mentioned that you have OVSDB. So, can you comment on why OVSDB versus OF conflict? What, what was the reason for going with OVSDB versus choosing OF conflict? Simplicity. Very simple. Yeah. Actually, we want to make a, a kind of a create a bug report uh, issue for to the OMF to use OVSDB to support some of the menu functions. And it's very simple, we, we control it, we, we do OBSDP, right? so instead it goes through the consortium. Uh, I used to work at telephone company, so I know how the kind of standard process work. Um, anyway, so, um, <clears throat> uh, and they have a very smart uh, way of implementing the controller. Uh, during the lab, they run centralized, um, then in deployment, they run distributed. Distribute 
Harry would love this. It's a microcontroller. <laughs> you you vlog about. It is a, a very thin layer controller running on the switch actually in the port. Right. So to limit some of the issue you have with centralized controller redundancy, most of the problem between the controller and switch is that connection, right? Um, so they, they do that. I'm not saying that's the best way, but that's the way they choose. Um, uh, in progress, that's the OVSDB interface we talked about for inventory, event reporting, and other functions we like to uh, put in. Um, oh, other, than other than simplicity is then we don't need to add another interface, right? So we have an open, open flow interface, we have an OVSDB interface, so it's really, if you look at all the management, it's really just a table of data. I mean, open flow protocol can be defined as OVSDB as well. You don't need a protocol. Uh, but, um, so that's the decision. And after this, we have a bunch of new ideas on how a controller framework could be. So if anybody here wants to build a controller, come talk to me. Okay. Yes? Do you think for the event reporting, there needs to be another channel for telemetry? to get the information within the switch to the controller to make the you know, correct decisions for analytics? That's a very good question. Um, so you have a control plane, you have a data plane, what about a diagnostic plane? Right, so, but the question, do you want to put that into the controller? I mean, controller, so there are different the philosophy the of controller. Control could be a consumer. Yes, 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 okay. So, so if, you, if your definition of control is broader than just open flow control, yeah, I would say yes. You need a controller in the network to take those information to make decisions, right? Or, or expose that to the regular controller so it can make decisions. Yeah, so, yeah. So that part is nobody really worried because no one has gone through the first part of to program the switch here, so, right? So they're putting 10, 20, 100 flows and in the lab, but who cares about what diagnostic? Right? So until people go through this and go to deployment, then they will ask the same question you ask, how do I manage this network? What are the data I want for analysis uh, so I can keep the data, uh, um, can keep the network working? That's the design, right? <coughs> so what is modeling for <coughs> what-if analysis, you know, if I decide to grow here, to do it. Yeah. So I'll come back next year and tell you all the things that they need to do to do that diagnostic. Uh, <coughs> that's still the same path to be six, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, any more controller questions? Do, do you actually keep state on the thin, lightweight controller on the switch? Or is all the state kept in? Yeah, they, 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 are, they are states. Uh, Can you talk about your general strategy for how you <coughs> deal with consistent state across the various? Uh, okay, so between, switch, <coughs> between multiple switch, there's no need to maintain consistency. Right? So, so the controller on the switch keep the state consistency, like a, a state machine. I mean, mostly for a flow mod type of operation. Uh, they want to make sure that the flow installed is correctly uh, based on the previous installation uh, uh, status. So, so that level of consistency is maintained. But then there's a synchronization, okay. There's a synchronization between the, the microcontroller, actually a centralized management system. Okay, because that centralized management system needs to push set of things to the controller. So there's a very smart way of implementing it. I can't reveal too much, but there is a centralized um, intelligence and there's a distribution of the switch intelligence on the switch and there's kind of orchestration coordination between those. Right? So it's a, it's a big state machine and partition into centralized network level and the switch level. Yeah, it's, it's very light. Um, most of the stuff is kind of static, proactive type of operation. Right? So once it's configured, it just monitor the, the event coming from the switch. The dynamic, the reactive 
reactive event there, but it's not that much. So, so it was, um, let's see, what was one issue? Oh yeah, so, so like you said, the CPU on a switch is, is, is um, not that powerful, so when they put the controller running on the switch, uh, and you get time out a lot because the hello message did not get processed because of single thread implementation. So during initialization time, you put in, let's say, 500 rules, and uh, the, the hello did not get handled, so the controller keeps coming out. So you have to break that into chunks, uh, things like that. But then a multi thread implementation will help. Any other question? So the, uh, in the centralized part of the, the heavyweight controller, so is there a single one or there are multiple with the scaling units that you mentioned earlier? Ah, okay, so um, yeah, it will be multiple uh, ones for redundancy purpose. Uh, yeah, but right now I see, uh, I don't know. Um, but then the, <coughs> the because it's distributed, so the so the redundancy required for that centralized, it's not that critical. It depends on how your partition functions. Um, it's very seldom for the controller on the switch die. I mean, it's, it's very simple set of steps. You just keep running that. Uh, but redundancy required. And also in terms of scalability of that. I mean, if, yeah. if the whole, all units talk to a single one, does it scale? Right. So then, yeah, and the controller, yeah, they have, they have their own kind of intelligent way of doing controller level coordination, right? Because they have multiple data centers, and usually the controller for the local data center is on the inside of the data center, and how do you coordinate between multiple controllers? Um, so, I mean, there are all kinds of schemes that uh, people do. Um, but they develop their own scheme. And very small way of doing that. Okay, cool. Uh, any other question? Oh. Yeah, what was, what, in this particular use case, what was sort of the percentage of proactive rules versus reactive rules? Can you talk about that? Um, I think it's about um, 60, 40. The, the reactive rule is, for example, when they put in a new server, or when they learn a new IP address because some event happened, uh, so they will install a set of rules. So that's the most common event. Of course, there, there are other stuff, like when the port is down, and the thing failed, and things like that. Uh, software upgrade, All right, so it's a, they have a, uh, very good scheme to do software upgrade uh, for the switch and their controller. Um, so I would say 60-40. Um. And the, the, the proactive programming is, as you talked about earlier, mostly based on how IP addresses are partitioned in the different Yeah, the forwarding, right? The, the part that you know how you want to do forwarding, uh, what packet you want to draw, and, uh, what things you want to learn, what type of packet you want to go into controller, uh, things like that. <coughs> okay, so network management, uh, SMP, so I put a question mark. Uh, if it's needed, because existing infrastructure support, support SMP, where should it go? So we've been actually discussed that internally. Uh, I really don't want to put on the switch, so how about controller? The controller control all the switches, get all the events. This the controller, uh, so in this way, uh, controller is a broader definition, not just open flow controller, right? So it's an overall controller. So we put on the controller, uh, so generate, <coughs> like that gentleman said, aggregate all the network management information at the controller level and send it to the network management system. Inventory event reporting, <coughs> controller management is not a, Topic that uh, the moment you have controller outside the, the switch or control panel of the switch, the controller itself needs to be managed. 
So we are working on that uh, conclusion. Okay. So, so uh, I kind of went through the whole design cycle. Right? Um, the open flow cannot solve all the issues. Right? So you have to look at your application. You have to go through that design process and understand your application and do the scalability, figure out the forwarding rules. Then you decide, then you can make a decision whether open flow fit or not fit. Um, now, of course, uh, work with your vendor choice is very important because open flow is still new, even though we all always implement based on open flow <coughs> specification, but there are things that uh, you need to understand how the switch behaves before you can write your controller uh, because otherwise it's hard to anticipate the, 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 the behavior on the switch. Um, I work with a couple customers, so this one is doing deployment. We think there's a couple customers will deploy this year. Um, all the open flow applications need customization. It's very hard to find off the shelf applications that will work. They just all my customers go through that and we all decided it, it's very hard, right? So all control all open flow control applications require customization. Uh, if you don't have the domain knowledge how the operation it's wrong, it's very hard to write control. So I think that's a major issue today that we see I mean, a lot of people buying our switches but very few deployment. Right? So we can't sell the switch even the switch work perfectly, except IPv6. But, but we can't sell the switch because no one really can develop a controller fast enough. But without controller it won't work. I mean you can program through this OBS CLI, but that's just for that. So we're trying to address that ourselves. Uh, we're trying to collect all the knowledge we have based on the customer deployment and trying to provide a framework to allow people to write a control application faster. Uh, scalability has to be designed. I kind of went through that. You can scale indefinitely. Uh, automation of the whole network management, configurations, visibility, because the template, the rule you define there, so you should know exactly how it works. And to save the uh, OPEX or not. They don't have a, this customer, they don't have a networking step to manage a network like a traditional network. Right? So the controller they develop actually handle network management function. It's the same set of Staff that managing servers, managing customer services, that manage the network. Very few people. Uh, control is still the key to open for the point. So, that's all. You didn't talk about what kind of CPU do you have, how much memory is it? Oh, on the switch? Uh, on the small one, it's a single core free scale. On the 10G, it's a dual core free scale. I think it's. Uh, one gig memory, half a gig. How much memory was that one? It's even my customer doesn't know. <laughs> I, I think it's a um, half gig memory. So from the level management, how can we do those uh, like a uh, performance management, how we monitor the port or the CPU utilization like uh, what we usually does in IP network? OBSDB. That's the only thing. <laughs> that's, that's one way we're, we're implementing. So we, would, we define a bunch of tables. I mean, OBSDB originally has the CPU usage already. If you look at OBSDB schema, it has the CPU usage. They also include VM and stuff like that. But, on the, but like inventory and those, it's, it's really a, a simple table that, that we populate and you can just take it, get it. So on your slide about network management, you had SNMP and a question mark, and you kind of it out as a question, but how would you answer that question? Do we need SMB? No. <laughs> <laughs> because you like IPv6, just drop it. You don't need it. Well, as you pointed out, if it was on the switch, it would be a lot of code on the switch. I guess that's but, one of the So if you really do know. want it, because the infrastructure is there, right? Then I would say put on the controller. So you can do all the things like alarm suppression right. for a group of switches and report set a thing to your HP OpenView or other network management system that need a SMP interface. So you're saying that 
So you're not well, saying punt it to OBSDB, that's just a temporary solution? Um, no, on the switch. For the switch. On the switch, you can do everything SMP do. SMP is a table too, yeah. right? It's, then it goes through a protocol to get it. So that's our implementation, or uh, our intention to do that. So SMP can be on the controller. But your customers are demanding some, <coughs> some level of SMP? Yeah, we have customers who want, because they're SMP, but I told them they don't need it. So let's see if they listen. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. But when you say you don't need it, is the reasons for that, depending on where it's implemented, let's say it's on the controller, right? Is that because it doesn't provide the visibility that it needs to, like, you need to look at the screen uh, to see the size? Because... So why are you saying you don't need it? Because some that, okay, on the switch, because some of the data that's important for open flow diagnostic, it's very hard to get it to SMP work and stuff like that. Right? So, so... On the switch, we like to export those data through a different mechanism, OBSDB plus others. Uh, but then the SMP interface, in my mind, maybe controls better way, better place to do it. I mean, that's just my view. So. Is it advocated that the PKA switch to support S flow? I'm sorry? Do your switches support S flow? S flow? Yes. Yeah, S flow and F flow supported. So, in which case, then some of these questions about visibility could actually be answered. Oh yeah, so yeah, so if you want to do yeah, so if you want to use S flow and F flow to get visibility on the flow level, yeah, you can you can get it. But there are other things you can't get from there. Well, well, for example, with S flow, you're also getting the standard interface counters. Oh yeah, so those things we, we, so we support. All of those would be yeah, the collector interface you configure it will send there. So, uh, can, you come in, the can you come in briefly about the administration and maintenance overhead of the network that is deployed? The admin administration and maintenance. Oh. Administration of the switches? Yeah. Um, Routine IP administration, things go wrong, needs need to be changed or manage downtime and all those things. So, what right, so um, there is a major portion of the administration is done manually. Okay. So they could be added into the controller software to do automation and things like that. Um, but inside the data center for that application, the administration requires actually not that much. It's a very simple operation. Right. Um, I just want to know whether so this one is it just a brand new deployment, or do do you have any case that just talking about from the migration from the legacy IP uh, data center level and move to here? No, just brand new. Yeah. In your deployment, the customer, did you have any operations and management kind of protocols running to kind of make sure that there's always service assurance or connectivity between different devices? They do. They they have. I mean, they, they, they develop their own kind of oh. protocol to that, so they want to complete it. Can you talk about uh, how easy is the troubleshooting in an open flow based deployment compared to a traditional deployment? For example, two hosts are not able to talk to each other. So where do you start? Uh, uh, right now it's kind of hard. You have to understand uh, the, the switch. Uh, I mean, first thing you do, you do a dump flow, a dump all the flows. But if you have 1,600 folds, then it doesn't help you. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so to figure out what's going on in the network, to get that business ready, right now the data is there, but the analytic tool is not there yet to help you make that. Uh, so, where is the most system. common point? At the control side or at the bandwidth side? Yeah. Both. Uh, um, the controller will make certain mistakes, right? So, uh, but then the controller mistake, then you end up you have to go to the switch to, to figure it out. So, uh, next year I can tell you. <laughs> just go, go into production. Uh, okay.
mention about controller, right? Like, what is required of controller? You mean the controller application? Uh, okay, so this is a good question. So if you look at the way today controller application is developed, right? So it doesn't matter what framework you take, you start writing code. Right? So you do Python or Java, you write code, you do a build, you do a test, but you won't have an environment to test large scale design. Right? You test, you release, you put on the controller front, uh, things, you, you test, most of the time you handle maybe, I uh, will use this 70%, you kind of figure out 70% of the scenario you can handle in the logic you put in the control. So that 30%, every time you release the code, you put in the network, it happens 1% of the time. So you have to do it 30 times. So every, every time you find a problem, it goes through this entire development cycle. Write code, change it, build, test, release, upgrade, bam, that's not an issue. So what do you do? So, this is my personal view. So today's controller framework, the way you write the controller is very traditional. But in a new technology like this, it's very hard to go in production. So that's another thing. So, so we're thinking uh, a different way of, of building controller framework to eliminate some of the issues we see in the controller development. Right. So the most people, <coughs> they're great. Python, Java developers, um, but they don't have the domain knowledge the customer wants. But the customer may not have those programming expertise, right? So um, even they do the IT stuff, they don't know networking. So there's there's a there's a gap in terms of how to get control application developed that can work going into production. <coughs> Yeah, I know. Right. Well, OpenFlow 2.0. Yeah. Right, but yeah. So I don't want to comment on that. But there's a fundamental issue: is how to turn even a new language. Uh, how do you turn people who understand the application or the behavior? How to turn that into a set of code or language that runs a switch? Right. It goes through another compilation step. And it's another layer of visibility you have to worry about. <clears throat> Just like when you use multiple table, but the T can only support one table, multiple table get mapped into a single table, you won't recognize anything. You don't have no idea what's going on when the pack is not flowing based on what you want to do. So will the compiler help? We will see. And my next question is, you are, you are not skeptical about that, not me, but how do you figure out the net count and Yang uh, combination? Ah. I think you're skeptical about that also. It's also IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> you ask me now, they say, yes, I got IPv6. But uh, let's see, I don't know. Uh, if, if, every, if all the customer wants it, we build it. Um, it's, it's not my, it's not really my problem. Whatever the customer wants it. We would do it. We say, oh, if config is the right way to go, we build it. I mean, it's not, it's not hard. Okay. Uh, because so, it, it can it can also be the controller, right? Rather than in your. Yeah, it could be in the controller too. It can rather than being a switch though, like. Right. Uh, there could be also. Switch has to be asked down. That's what you said, right? right. right. It's smart people than me. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Good. So, thank you, everybody. You have my email if you questions and thank you. Yeah. So do you